invite you now to please find a seat. And of course, the front has lots of room. <laughs> My name is uh, Father Mark Latkovich, and I'm the President and Rector of Borneo and St. Mary's Seminary, and I'm really privileged to welcome you tonight to the first lecture event of Borneo Seminary's Catholic Perspective Lecture Series entitled, Of Two Minds, A Neuroscientist Balances Faith and Science. This is the um, first lecture um, of lecture on science and religion. And we are grateful tonight to have sponsorship from the John Templeton Foundation, who made the Science in Seminaries project, facilitated by Dr. Doris Donnelly and John Carroll University, possible. As rector of both seminaries, I'm proud to say and acknowledge that each of our seminaries were awarded a $10,000 grant to not only create new courses in our curriculum on science and religion, but also to sponsor these lectures, such as the one we have this evening. The next lecture will be on October 8th, and Dr. Beth Rath, who I will introduce in a few moments, will tell you more about that. This initiative acknowledges and responds to the vision that the church proposes for seminary training in its intellectual formation since Vatican II. In the decree on the training of the priests from Vatican II, it claims that seminarians should be equipped with scientific training and that they should be conversant with recent scientific progress. Another document of Vatican II, the Church in the Modern World, notes that recent studies and findings in science history and philosophy often raise new questions which influence life and demand new theological investigations. This vision formed by the Second Vatican Council is further implemented by the Ratio Fundamalis, which is, used to be under the Congregation of Education at the Vatican, which guides bishops as they create the national program for priestly formation in seminaries. Now it's under the congregation of the clergy. But this ratio encouraged college level studies within the curriculum should include studies of the natural science as they dialogue with philosophy and theology and even mathematics. And finally, St. John Paul II's Pastoral Dabo Vobis, his encyclical on the priesthood for the modern era, maintains that the challenge of the new evangelization shows us how important intellectual formation is, especially as we consider our culture today. Today's situation is marked by fresh problems and questions brought up by the science community and certainly technological discoveries. It strongly demands a high level of intellectual formation that will enable future priests to proclaim in a context like this the gospel of Christ and to make it credible as that gospel is looked at through the lens of human reason. If ordinary ministry dialogues with the world, then scientific literacy is necessary as a part of the new evangelization by a priest who ministers and who preaches the gospel in a world that often has scientific and technological concerns. These tools will help engage the world in the new evangelization. So I think we're right on target here in Wycliffe, Ohio, as tonight Dr. Beth Rath will now introduce our speaker. Science and Religion Lectures at Borromeo this fall. 
These events, as Father Lakovich said, are made possible by a generous grant from the John Templeton Foundation to the Science in Seminaries project, of which we are part. After the lecture, we'll have a period of Q&A, and um, if you have a question during that time, please just raise your hand, and someone with a microphone, probably me, uh, will come to you. We'll have a chance for further fellowship and conversation, along with some light refreshments out in the lobby just outside these doors after the lecture finishes up. It is a, a great privilege for us to have with us this evening Dr. William Newsom, Bill Newsom. He comes to us from Stanford University in California. He earned his PhD in neurobiology from the California Institute of Technology in 1980 and is currently professor of neurobiology at Stanford. He has received many honors and, reward, and awards, <laughs> maybe rewards too, awards both for his teaching and his scholarship. I'll share just two examples with you. In 2000, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. And in 2013, he was one of two scientists chosen to co-chair the planning committee for the Brain Research Through Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies Project. We may know this project as the Brain Initiative. The objective of this government-sponsored project is to understand brain function by mapping the brain's 100 billion neurons and diagramming the connections between them. By learning more about how the brain works, the Brain Initiative team hopes to find cures for neurological disorders like Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's. <coughs> Some of Bill's current research focuses on the relationship between brain and behavior. In particular, he considers the link between the way the brain processes messages from the eyes and visually guided behavior. Bill also speaks regularly on the relationship between science and faith, arguing that the findings of science do not render religious faith untenable. A voice in the public arena arguing for the compatibility between the findings of faith and traditional religious views is much needed today. A Pew Research survey in 2015 shows that about 59% of Americans and as many as 73% maintain that there is a fundamental conflict between science and religion. Today, Bill will not resolve all apparent points of tension between science and religious faith. That would be an impossible task. Instead, he'll just focus on one piece of the puzzle this evening in his presentation entitled, Of Two Minds, A Neuroscientist Balances Science and Faith. Please help me to welcome Dr. Bill Newsom. Pleasure to be with you here tonight, and as Beth said, I just want to uh, 
do some reflections on this, these issues of science and faith. It's a privilege to be a part of this lecture series. I think this dialogue and sort of bringing science and, uh, into seminaries and having a two-way dialogue is a fantastic project that took the foundation. It's delightful that Norman is a part of it. And I'm very privileged to be here and be part of it this evening. So my students always tell me when I start a lecture that I should get the big picture. So, <laughs> here's the big picture. <laughs> you are here uh, in a very uh, small and insignificant galaxy among a fathomably large ocean of galaxies that, that blows all of our minds if we think about it for a few minutes. And for a neuroscientist like myself, the even more amazing fact is that uh, everything you know about this galaxy and every action that we make in your world is mediated through three pounds of fat, basically, that sits between your ears inside your head. A brain that has 100 billion neurons, each neuron has a thousand connections, so you're up to 100 trillion connections. It's the most complex entity of the known universe. The internet might catch up at some point, but uh, as far as we know, this is the most complex entity of the universe at the, at the moment. And how this thing works and how it makes the biology of the brain make our mental lives possible, our emotional lives possible, you know, is a question that consumes neuroscience and has consumed me for the bulk of my professional life. Uh, tonight, I will cover two things rather than the one that Beth promised. Um, there really are three topics that ought to be addressed tonight, and I frequently talk about these. One is religion and the finding of science. So are there findings of science that are fundamentally antithetical to religion and the actual discoveries? And I'm going to give very short shrift to that tonight. I'm just going to assert no, in my opinion. There are no findings, discoveries of science that are, um, that are, that render religion untenable. I want to talk and spend more time on religion and some of the assumptions of science, the operational assumptions of science, the basic worldview that many scientists have. And there I think that there are uh, conflicts and tensions, and I, I want to have something to say about that. And then what I hope to spend most of my time on is actually thinking about uh, problems with brain science that trouble a lot of people, thinking about well, if the brain causes our behavior and the brain has mechanisms that underlie all of these parts of our personalities and behaviors, which it undeniably does. Uh, how does that uh, render possible the idea of any kind of free will and moral responsibility for the law, the national law, or God's law, or any other kind of law you want to think about? It? So I really want to spend my bulk of my time on those last two. I'll just say a word about the findings. I mean, I think actually uh, some of the really major findings of science are remarkably consistent with uh, traditional uh, Christian theology. I think that you know the Big Bang, for example, says that there was a moment of creation when all of our universe was created about 14 and a half million years ago, uh, and it was a moment. And before that moment, space and time did not exist. And it's hard to imagine a scientific result and finding that would be more compatible with the doctrine of creation and the Bible than that, than that one. Uh, you know, we have to interpret the, 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 the narratives of Genesis, but the fundamental spiritual points in Genesis, I think, are remarkably consistent. There are also the findings that many of you are probably aware of, of the what's called the anthropic principle. The fact that there are these handful of constants, mathematical constants, that govern gravitational forces, that govern uh, chemical bonds, and many other things, and are known to extremely precise numbers. And if those constants were any further off, if they were many, many, or just one among many decimal points off, then our universe would not have existed long enough for life to have evolved the way that it has, and we would not have a universe that's welcoming to life. And it's, uh, they're, they're, this doesn't prove anything about creation, but at least it is compatible with the idea of creation of a humanizing <coughs> kind of universe. And I, I think that's a, a thing. And in the circles that I grew up in, Baptist circles, evolution tends to be the big tension, right? Uh, Catholics don't seem to have such a problem with that. I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Personally, I have no problem with the idea that God created through evolution. Uh, there are some people who do. But any of these kinds of things, I'd be happy to comment on in the question and answer period afterwards. But I'm just going to assert right now 
that in terms of actual scientific discoveries, things published in the papers that we know to be true about the universe, I don't, I don't find big conflicts there between science and religion. Uh, but now, religion and the assumptions of science, let me just say that tension can occur here. This is where I find most, much tension to occur, um, especially when the assumptions of everyday science are elevated to the status of an all-encompassing ideology. So science, in my mind, it has a set of assumptions about mechanisms in the world, and most famously, it has a method for testing hypotheses about how the natural world works. And that's great. I've dedicated most of my life to being a laboratory scientist, and I believe in that method and validity, validity of results and insights obtained by that method. Uh, what I don't believe is that that is the only way to knowledge, okay? And I'll have a little bit more to say about that in a moment. And that there are other ways that all of us, scientists and non-scientists alike, uh, must other things that we must rely on to, uh, to make decisions about how to live our lives. Now, science is frequently, you know, it's, it, there are differences between science and religious communities. Science tends to be experiment-based. It tends to be precise and quantitative when it's at its best. It tends to be objective in the sense that it's very transferable across communities and cultures. So if I discover something in my laboratory and I'm doing things right and I publish my papers well, somebody in Japan or India or China or anywhere in Western Europe can replicate those data if they have the, the right equipment and follow the right procedures, they can replicate it and verify that it's true right there in their own laboratory. And there's this universal nature and objective nature to science that's really you know, quite admirable. And a lot of our progress as a culture is based on that. And religion is more holistic in a sense. Uh, it tries to see a greater set of phenomena, in my opinion, than science does. And it has a greater dependence on intuition. <coughs> And it frequently requires commitment in the absence of proof in a scientific sense. Now, you know, science requires some commitment as well. There, there, there are histories of many great scientists who have gone against the grain in science and have kept at it and ultimately proved their point because they had some internal conviction that they were right. You know, and some, some internal faith that drove them in a sense. So these things, these pictures that I'm painting here are not black and white. Okay? There are shades of gray here, but there are differences in emphasis, I think. And many of my scientist friends, you know, who know that I'm a religious person, I'm going to church on Sundays, whatever, you know, I, I occasionally have conversations, and many of them uh, just don't see why I bother with the religion. You know, this is kind of holistic, intuitive, you know, uh, requiring some kind of faith in the absence of proof. And basically they say, why go there? Why not just stick with science? You know, and I actually had a postdoc in my lab say to me once, you know, we were talking about this kind of stuff over the watch, and he said, he said, he said, I just don't get this, Bill. This is so different from the way you normally think. <laughs> you know, he's, he's talking about me as the scientist in the lab where I have extremely rigorous criteria for what I admit to the, the canon of truth that I believe in scientifically. And he sees me as way out there on the limb in this religion thing, and, he's, and, and it's like, why even go there? Why not just stick with science? And my answers go, go like this, and this is what I want to try to say about um, you know, this, this tension, kind of how in my own mind I resolve this, this tension. I, I think that the religious mode of thought and belief is a normal and necessary mode of evaluation and decision making in real life for all of us. For all of my scientific colleagues, for everyone in this room, for everyone out there in a, in a local parish, uh, that it's necessary for all of us. And I think that the scientific mode of thinking, in contrast, is, is really peculiar in human history. Uh, it's applicable to a rather narrow range of experience, and it's generally practiced by a rather small uh, community of professionals. And I would argue here that the most important questions of life are not susceptible to solution by the scientific method. That all of us have to rely on other, other ways to reach conclusions about the most important questions in life. In fact, I might even go so far as to argue that the importance of a question is inversely proportional to the certainty with which it can be answered. So we know the value of the universal gravitational constant out to many decimal places. Um, and if that's important for allowing the existence of life in the universe, but how important is it to you in your daily life, right? And so some questions that can be answered with tremendous precision turn out not to be that, that important or consequential. 
Now, in contrast, there are really important questions that we all have to address and make decisions about that simply can't be answered in the scientific laboratory. And the most important one to me is this one. Is it better to live or to die? And, you know, for some of you uh, in, in, this, in an audience this size, either from your personal experience or from people you're close to, you know that this is a real issue for a lot of people in our society and our parishes. And it's, it's not something you can go into a lab and do a set of experiments on and come out with a firm answer for someone, right? This, the, and making decisions like this are different. Uh, here's another one that many of us have faced. Should I pursue a professional opportunity elsewhere in the country at the cost of uprooting my entire family, all of whom have their own independent lives? Uh, again, this is not something you've got a one-time shot at decisions like this. And you have to make the decisions based on a combination of factors, and it doesn't include going to the laboratory and doing scientific experiments. And you know, the basic point I'm doing here in science, we would say we can't do controlled experiments. So in science, you want to manipulate some variable and see how it comes out, and you want to set up the same situation all over again, manipulate the variable in another direction or with a different quantity and see what the result is. And you want to do lots of these controlled manipulations. But we don't have shots at this, so at, at these controlled experiments or questions like this. I uh, go on to, you know, this is one relevant for some people in this audience. Should I enter the priesthood? Forsaking a standard life in hope of finding a greater good. Uh, or for other people in the audience, a rephrase of this question might be, should I marry any particular person, right? Uh, this is not something that you can get you can get a ton of data on in advance. And, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and the bottom line here is that this is just the human condition. This is the condition that we all live in. It's life. And our most consequential decisions in life have little or nothing to do with science. And this is true not only for those of us in this room, but it's true for everyone, including my scientific colleagues. If you wait to have certainty about whether you should marry uh, this person or that person, and you wait for all the data to come in, uh, you'll never get, you'll never, never make those kinds of commitments. So I think for everyone, uh, the real question is, is there an ultimate source of meaning and value in the universe? And if so, what is it? And I would argue that this kind of, I, this is the primordial religious question in my mind. Is there a source of meaning and value in the universe? And if so, what is it? That's the start of the religious quest. And I would say that the religious quest involves the same sort of reasoning as the priesthood or marriage examples that I gave just a minute ago. Um, it doesn't mean when you're deciding whether to get married or not, it doesn't mean that you check your brain at the door, right? It doesn't mean you flip a coin or you throw a dart at a, uh, at a, at a donkey. Uh, there's, there's sources of evidence that are available, right? You have, in making a religious commitment, you have a primary experience within your religious community. You, know, you actually have data within the religious community. You have a testimony of people who've gone before you, other, other seekers throughout the ages, and you have critical reflections of, of fellow travelers that you meet along the way. Uh, and you take all of these sources of evidence into consideration when you make these, these, these things. So it's not, as though, it's not as though you're checking your brain at the door. It's not the case at all. But in the end, the evidence that you can accumulate here is not compelling in a scientific sense. Uh, there's an element of faith here accompanied by commitment that is essential. And, you know, the stakes are very high. Uh, making a religious commitment, you may be going off on a completely wrong track. On the other hand, you may be getting in touch with the most uh, deepest and most important reality in our universe. So, you know, these are consequential decisions and the stakes are high. And, you know, for me, I was raised in the church. I you know, ask critical questions like most people with two wits to rub together, start asking critical questions at some point, reflecting on your experience and whether your commitments are the result of simply of the culture you're in and what you're handed to. Uh, you realize there are certain problematic areas and you can start making decisions about, about things you really commit to and you don't. Uh, but for me, I mean, the, the lens of my Christian faith makes more sense of the world to me than any other ideological lens that I can put on. Uh, and I go back frequently to, uh, this is one of my favorite uh, quotes from uh, the book of John. And uh, Jesus, and this is a very long chapter in the book of John, John 6, 
uh, and Jesus had engaged in some particularly difficult teachings, and you know, that were just not the people around him weren't ready to wrap their heads around it. And uh, John says, after this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer went about with him. So, so he lost followers here. And Jesus said to the twelve, Do you wish to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. Uh, and that's kind of the way that I feel after, you know, 40, 50 years touring through academia and being exposed to lots of ideas and thoughts. Um, I don't see a better way. I don't, I don't see something that inspires me, calls out the best things in me, challenges me as much as the life of Christ. So um, that, that bit here in John 6 continues. Peter continues, and I, I think this is really, really interesting, this little phrase here. It, it continues, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Now, look, look at what, what they're saying there. Peter say, he, he didn't say we know, it was proven to us, and therefore we believed. He's putting in exactly the opposite order. He's saying, we believed and have come to know. You know, living out our experience of community, we've come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So this is kind of what I was saying while I'm going to write, that you don't check your brain anymore, you think, you're open to experience, um, but it's, at some point there's this element of faith, there's this element of commitment, and your experience subsequently either bears it out or it doesn't. So I'll just summarize this part of the talk by saying that repeating at this very high level, from my point of view, there is no deep conflict between my religious faith and actual findings of science. And I would, I would just repeat this, the tension can occur between religion and these working assumptions of everyday science. And, but really, when science is elevated from a method and an approach to learning about the natural world to almost its own religion or its own ideology, where the conviction becomes that the scientific method is the only way to know things reliably about the world, that's what I object to. That's where the tension really occurs. And I think that many practitioners of science carry that assumption around inside their heads, even though their behavior can't possibly be based on that, right? Okay, so let's turn to the brain now. Beth, Beth told you what I'm really known for is not theology or philosophy, it's for the brain, about the brain. So let's talk a little bit about the brain. And I'll start talking about the brain by talking about what I call the central dogma of neuroscience. This is kind of you know, the central assumption that, that drives a lot of neuroscientists in their, in their research. And that central dogma is this. All of our behavior and all of our mental life, including our sense of conscious, continuing self, is inextricably linked to the biology of the brain. So this is very not Cartesian, right? This is very not Descartes. So Descartes thought that there was a mind living out there in space somewhere, and the brain sort of interacted with the body and gave commands to the body. And Descartes' intellectual problem was, well, how does this mind living out in space somewhere interact with the brain and the body? And he identified the pineal gland. You know, this tiny little pineal gland is the place where the mind interacting with the body. How that happened it wasn't clear. The, this kind of dualist position has been held by a number of quite respectable people, including John Eccles, who won the Nobel Prize in neuroscience about 40 years ago, something like that, um, who was a strong Catholic and had dualistic beliefs like this. But the central dogma of neuroscience is that you know, there's not a mind living outside the brain, and, and you know, the, 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 the mind is in some sense what the brain does and our behavior is extremely linked to the brain. And, and the, uh, while this is a dogma, I don't say that it's completely a finding yet because we know that we're only scratching the surface of what there is to know about the brain. I would say that the evidence is building very rapidly in forms of you know, changes and things that we would consider higher personality. I'll give you an example of this in a minute. Uh, uh, you know, changes that, re that result after damage to certain very specific parts of the brain. It's very clear that there are brain mechanisms located in different areas of the brain that, that underlie memory, that underlie uh, tremendous aspects of personality, and attention, and perception, and so on and so forth. So evidence is accumulating for this, so, but I still call it a dogma, an assumption, not, not a demonstrated finding. Now, this inevitably raises questions, right? If the decisions that we make, and the choices we make, aspirations that we have, goals, rewards, uh, beliefs, if they're in some way coming out of that biology, uh, what does that say about free will? Okay? And if, and what, what do we think about our freedom of choice or not freedom of choice? 
And I think probably everyone in this room, if you think about it a little bit, you'll realize that many of our choices aren't free, right? I mean, we only have two candidates for president. <laughs> um, and I, we're constrained. We have to pay taxes, even though we don't agree with some of the purposes that those taxes are used for in many, in many conditions. Uh, we, have, we all operate with cultural biases and assumptions that many times we're not even aware of. And, and so much of our behavior isn't free in some conscious sense of the word. But I, I think that some of our behavior is meaningfully free. The question is, how do we talk about that in the light of the brain? Now, somebody, it sounds like something Woody Allen would have said, but I know it wasn't Woody Allen. I can't actually remember who it is. But this question of free will was raised, and the response was, I am not a fatalist, but even if I were, what can I do about it? <laughs> uh, but it, taking a more serious look at this, this, this is uh, not just an airy-fairy, right, a, a concern. This has very practical concerns in our society. And one of the great areas of concern is in the area of criminal responsibility. So more and more over the last decade, we're seeing uh, brain scans, brain imaging data being introduced as evidence in courts uh, that defendants have diminished or no responsibility, so they deserve less punishment. They're less culpable because their brains are different from other people's brains. And um, I think courts are struggling with this now, the way they struggled 20, 30 years ago with DNA evidence and how reliable that was and whether it should be admitted, which of course it's now admitted it's known to be very highly reliable and it, it has huge effects in court cases. Uh, the brain stuff is not so clear yet. Uh, judges don't know what to do about it. Judges tell neuroscientists, if you can help us out understanding this and what it really means, you will do us a big, a big favor. And this issue of criminal responsibility is not a new issue. Uh, those of you who are real scholars, and I know there are some of you here who are, are who know St. Augustine of Hippo very, very well, Augustine wrestled with this. Paul wrestled with this, right? Paul has said, the good that I want to do, I can't do, and the very evil that I don't want to do, I find myself doing, right? So, so, so this, this goes back a long time. Uh, but an example that I'll give you here is this guy, Charles Footman. Uh, some of you who are about my age will recognize who this is. Uh, most of you who are younger than me have probably never heard of this guy. Uh, but Charles Whitman was the first of kind of the modern age of mass shooters. He was an undergraduate at the University of Texas. He was an ex-Marine. Uh, and on one beautiful day in Texas, he climbed to the top of the tower that's at the center of the University of Texas campus with a high-powered rifle. And he shot, I think he killed 16 people and wounded 31 uh, before he turned the gun on himself and killed himself. Um, and this is, the, this is the tower at the University of Texas. Now, Footman is a particularly interesting case because he kept a pretty careful diary and made lots of notes uh, as he was leading up to this event. And you can read them. This is all available on Google you can, or Wikipedia. You can go and read about this stuff. But uh, Whitman's diary notes are very poignant. Uh, and several days before climbing the tower, this is an excerpt from his diary. He says, lately I've been a victim of many unusual and irrational thoughts. I consulted Dr. Cochran at the University Health Center and asked him to recommend someone that I could consult about for some psychiatric disorders I felt I had. I talked to a doctor once for about two hours and tried to convey to him my fears that I felt overcome by overwhelming violent impulses. After one session, I never saw the doctor again, and since then, I've been fighting my mental turmoil alone and seemingly to no avail. After my death, I wish that an autopsy would be performed to see if there was any visible physical disorder. So Whitman uh, is very unusual in the sense that he knew that something deeply wrong was going on with him. He suspected that it was biological. He's asking for an autopsy, right? Uh, but he is powerless to stop himself. Uh, he goes on later in his notes. He says, that it was after much thought that I decided to kill my wife, Kathy, tonight. I love her dearly, and she has been as fine a wife to me as any man could ever hope to have. I cannot rationally pinpoint any specific reason for doing this. So he actually killed his wife and his mother with a hunting knife before climbing the tower and taking the gun to the other people. Uh, Whitman left another note with his body. He said, if my life insurance policy is valid, please pay off my debts, donate the rest anonymously to a mental health foundation, maybe research can prevent further tragedies of this type. So it turns out that Whitman's brain didn't shoot himself in the head. 
uh, his brain actually was subjected to an autopsy. It turned out that he had a tumor. And he had a tumor in the brain right about this location here, sort of impinging on a structure called the hypothalamus and a structure on the other side called the amygdala. And any of you who are psychologists or biologists, uh, you know that those two structures are deeply involved in regulation of emotions. Uh, so, you know, Whitman's intuition that something was wrong with his brain is true. But did this tumor cause uh, the turmoil that he was experiencing? We, we don't know the answer to that question, and we'll never know the answer to that question. It may have been related, it may not have been related, but it is, at best, it, it, at least it's an extremely striking coincidence. Uh, the, the reflections, his internal reflections in the objective evidence uh, found afterwards. So this makes even more poignant this question of what about free will, right? I mean, um, if there was dysregulation or injury to these subcortical structures that are involved in emotional regulation, and Whitman was aware of what was going on, that he was powerless to control his impulses, uh, it raises the larger question that even in normal behavior, are we all dancing to the tune of uh, you know, circuits that we don't know about and that we can't control, and we tell ourselves this story about free choices, but in reality, we're no more free than Whitman was, right? That's, that's, that's the specter that comes up. So what about free will? How can, how can a neuroscientist like myself or, or, or people like you think about this? And I'm, I'm gonna spend the rest of my time sharing my thoughts about that. And the argument is going to get a little bit intricate at points, and so you know, make notes if you have questions, if, if, I, if I leave you behind at some point and, and flag me down in the question and answer session, I'm happy to kind of readdress these. I'm going to say that there are kind of four alternatives that are, that are out there, three of which I don't really like or, or believe in very much. So one is, is kind of what I just, the picture that I just painted, the bottom up, I'll call it the bottom up deterministic brain. So all causality is down in the chemicals and the electrical signals and these deep brain circuits and you know, we're, we're, we dance to the tunes of our genes and neurons and that's, that's you know, what human behavior is ultimately about. Now we know that that this deterministic worldview is, is, is not correct in any strict sense of the word. We know that um, there are non-deterministic events that can have massive effects in the world. So the quantum mechanical, the classic quantum mechanical events are not predictable, right? They're, they're statistical. And uh, the classic quantum mechanical event is absorption of a photon. Uh, that's how quantum mechanics was all started, was experiments with lights and the light and photons. Uh, and the absorption of highly uh, energetic cosmic ray photons from the sun underlies many cancers, you know, melanomas that we get in our skin and when people die, it changes everything about their worlds and their kids' worlds and their loved ones' worlds. So it's a quantum mechanical event, not predictable. It's fundamentally not predictable. So this bottom-up deterministic world doesn't, doesn't really work. There are quantum mechanical, little quantum mechanical windows onto determinism. And I don't like thinking about humans completely in terms of bottom-up uh, mechanisms, as you'll see in a moment. Um, I think they're important, but I don't like thinking about humans completely in those terms. Now, some people take quantum mechanics, and some very respectable people like Roger Penrose, the famous physicist, uh, thinks that quantum mechanical events create an opening for free will. And he particularly, he goes down to certain little tiny structures inside cells called microtubules that he thinks have quantum, are subject to quantum mechanical fluctuations, and that this, this creates uh, room in the brain to have mechanisms that are not deterministic and opens up an element of freedom. And you know, the famous uh, Anglican physicist and uh, clergyman John Polkinghorne uh, in Britain, uh, I think, entertains these same kind of ideas. I don't believe this is true. My, my gut feeling is that this isn't on the tar on the money. Um, quantum mechanics, I mean, uh, all, I've consulted several very high level biophysicists about this, people that I know in this judgment I trust. They have got much more about biophysics than I do. And fundamentally, they say there are there is noise in the brain. We know that there are sources of noise in the brain, but it's mostly thermal noise. It's, it's a result of heat that causes random opening and closing of channels and membranes. And that the molecules that form these channels are too big to be subject to quantum mechanical fluctuations. And that seems to be the majority opinion. And so I don't, 
I, and there are other reasons also that I just I sort of think that quantum mechanics is barking up the wrong tree. If you look to quantum mechanics as a solution to the problem of free will. Now here's another one, and I, I want you to think a bit about this one because I think I that this is this is the most common model of freedom that's carried around by the general person on the street and maybe the average person in this room for all I know. And that is that, that freedom, the definition of freedom, is a decision that you make that's uncaused. Right? If there is a cause to the decision, if we decide, I just decided that we were going to have fish or beef in a dinner, uh, and actually I decided to have both. Uh, <laughs> but, it, it, but certain people feel like, okay, if there are these mechanisms in your brain that are bubbling away, and basically the outcome of that decision was determined a long time ago by it, it could only have come out one way, and, uh, they, and there were mechanisms that caused that choice, then it wasn't free. Okay? This is, this is something I think is deeply ingrained in all of us, that, that the definition of something is free is something that does not have a cause. Uh, and I want to argue that that is wrong, okay? I think that our choices do have causes. I want to think that even my ethical and moral choices have causes, that they have causes that are based on my personal history, on memories that I have, on values that I've adopted, on ethical principles that I've adopted, and I would like to think that most of my free decisions are consistent and some sense caused by, by those things. Now, sometimes it's caused by more selfish things, but I, I don't think that this notion that a free choice is an uncaused choice, I don't think that's tenable. Um, what I think we really mean by freedom and what our intuitions tell us what we really want is that what freedom is is self-determination or autonomy, okay? So it's not uncaused, it's, it's determined in a sense, but it's determined within ourselves. So here is my elements of my attempt to define the self-determination or autonomy. And I, I define it this way. That it's a conviction that my behavior is caused at least in part. I'm not saying 100%, and we can argue about the percentage, okay? But at least in part, my behavior is caused by my beliefs, my values, my memories, my goals, my aspirations. And those, from a neuroscientist point of view, at least this neuroscientist point of view, are higher order configurations of the nervous system. But these are where the root causes are. If my behavior is caused because somebody's got a gun in my head and says, you do this or else, you take a bullet, uh, that is not a free choice. I'm under serious constraints here. If I'm under emotional manipulation by people, or if I'm under advertising manipulation by the wizards of Madison Avenue or Silicon Valley, uh, many of my choices are not free choices. Uh, I can't choose to play basketball like LeBron James. I have physical restrictions that uh, prevent that from happening, right? There are many, many things about my, me and my behavior that are restricted by my biology, but, it, but at least part uh, is, is, it can, is, needs to be consistent with these higher order values, goals, aspirations, convictions, if the behavior is going to be considered to be free. A second thing is that conscious, rational thought plays some sort of causal role in my behavior that we are able to rethink, to think rationally, reflectively, critically, and consciously, and make choices that are uh, life-giving choices, uh, life-nourishing uh, and enhancing choices, or selfish choices, and basically life-destructive choices. But that rational thought plays uh, some causal role, meaningful role in that behavior. Now the key issue here, if, if we kind of accept these things, and we talk about the key issue here is that road, that, that, road, that word causal. And the key issue is what counts as a cause, okay? Now, in physics, I was a physics student as an undergraduate, and I was taught that there were four basic forces. It's still the teaching as far as I know. The four basic forces in the world are gravity, uh, electricity and magnetism, which are interchangeable, two sides of the same coin. Weak nuclear forces and strong nuclear forces. Those are the four forces in the world. And forces are what do work in the world. And that's where all causality starts, is with those fundamental forces that work. And the goal of science is to take all of this elaborate nature that we have and understand how it all happens in terms of those four, four causal causes. 
Got it. If that's all, if that's the only way to think about causality, then we're kind of stuck, I think, in terms of thinking about free will. But I want to argue that we can count on, we, that these are not uh, the sole way to think about causes. There are other ways to think about cause. And I want to argue this actually from a neurobiological point of view. And I want to take uh, my, as my point of departure uh, some quotes from Carl Kramer's 2007 book, Explaining the Brain, which I recommend to any of you who are philosophically inclined and scientifically inclined. He's a philosopher of science, actually did a master's degree in neuroscience before his PhD in philosophy, so he knows laboratory neuroscience really, really well. Uh, so his emphasis in this book, how we explain the brain, how is it that neuroscientists are trying to explain the brain? Uh, Carl really emphasizes this notion of multi-levels, that the goal is not to reduce everything to one level, the four forces of physics, that the explanations of neuroscience are intrinsically multi-level, and, and that these mechanistic explanations uh, necessarily span these levels. So he talks about the systems tradition of neuroscience, and that's a part of the tradition that I'm in. I'm in systems neuroscience. I'm interested in how systems and circuits of neurons interact with each other, and how uh, circuits pile on each other to make super circuits that we can actually measure with human brain imaging experiments, and how those things are related to, to behavior and cognition. So Carl says the systems tradition construes explanation as a matter of decomposing systems into their parts, and showing how those parts are organized <coughs> together in such a way as to exhibit the explanation of the phenomenon. Explanation is just the thing you're trying to explain. So if you're trying to explain visual perception, or you're trying to explain memory or attention, that's the explanation. So he says it's decomposing the system in their parts. So we take this big brain, and we start looking at those underlying circuits, and the circuits that lie within circuits, we decompose it into the part. But the key thing he's saying here is see how they're organized together. And the or the O word, and I call this the O word, this organization thing is not something that can be reduced to these four forces of physics. And the organization is really critical. And systems explanations involve showing how something works rather than showing that its behavior can be derived from more fundamental laws. And I think that's a really critical insight that we're in, we're not on a, a uh, crusade to explain neuroscience in terms of more fundamental laws. What we are trying to do is simply show how something works. And a critical concept that Carl has is mutual manipulability. And, and when you study the mechanism of neuroscience, and I think, I, I, this, is, I, this is so true, this just rings so true from an experimental neuroscience point of view. This is what I do in the lab all the time. And this is the way you identify a mechanism in the brain. Uh, and he says a part is a component in a mechanism. If one can change the behavior of the mechanism as a whole by intervening to change the component, so that's one test, and one can change the behavior of the component by intervening to change the behavior of the mechanism as a whole. And Carl calls this making a difference. So in my work, we do a lot of work um, in visual perception and manipulating circuits inside the brain in the laboratory where you know, we can change the perceptual task that an animal is doing and we can show that the neurons behave differently as the animal uh, does different aspects of the task. But we can also get inside the brain with minute amounts of drugs or electrical stimulation. And we can show that if we change the parts, the components inside the brain, we can change the behavior. So this is exactly what he's talking about. He's saying you manipulate the high level and change the components, or you can manipulate the components and change the, the behavior. And then you know you're on the mechanism, you're on the truth. If you have a behavior and you hypothesize that it's due to changes in underlying neural circuits, and you go in and manipulate the circuits and the behavior doesn't change, then your hypothesis is wrong. You know, you're, you're toast. And uh, similarly, if you're on the right on the mechanism, then if you change the behavior, you should also change the activity of the neurons. So this kind of mutual manipulability, I think, is, 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 really, is really critical. Um, so this is what I really want to focus on, and I think it's where the truth is, and it's not on what I call fundamentalist reduction. So the, the notion that uh, the goal of science is to take all these high-level phenomena and reduce them down to the laws of physics, I think is, is misguided. I think it's misguided for a number of reasons. Number one, it doesn't work in real life. Even someone who's intellectually committed to this if, uh, if somebody, the kid throws a rock through a plate glass window in the front of their house, they won't say, well, that's just the four laws of physics working themselves out. <laughs> <laughs> they'll say, my God, something ought to be done about it. You know, they ought to be held accountable for his actions, right? It doesn't work in real life. It, 
doesn't describe what neuroscience actually do. We don't sit there, I, I've never reduced something you know, to the law of physics in my life. Um, there's this regression problem. If we take behavior and regress it down to circuits, uh, you know, the, the, the circuit people, uh, then the cellular people want to regress the circuits down to subcircuits, and the subcircuits down to single neurons. And the geneticists want to take those single neuron level and go down to genetics, but you know, the genes operate by molecular mechanisms. You can regress, 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 regress until you get down to quantum mechanics, right? Uh, and the problem is that everybody working at every one of those levels, they can feel like their level is the one that's fundamental. So the geneticists are deeply convinced that you know, genetics is the right level to be working, seeking solutions to these problems. And they get very nervous when the chemists say, no, this is all about chemicals. So that you've got this regression problem. Whose level is actually fundamental? And you know, at, at some level, the, the, the most fundamental level is arguably a column. And Bertrand Russell makes this argument in a very famous essay. He points out that in physics, when you get down to fundamental physics, they don't talk about causality. Uh, they talk about force equals mass times acceleration, F equals ma. You can rewrite that equation, and it's m equals f over a, or it's a equals f over m. It doesn't matter which side you put the terms on. There's this relationship between force, mass, and acceleration. And there's no causality. There's simply a relationship. And that's true for every law of physics that I know of, except one. And that is some chemist needs to help me here, which is, is it the first law of thermodynamics that says entropy tends to succeed, uh, tends to increase as, as time. I mean, second law of thermodynamics. I can't remember which law it is. That's the only one I know that actually has a time element in it. The entropy it, uh, increases with time. So most of the time, it's, it's a causal. And then, you know, the other problem that I have is, is, uh, is a poverty, what I call poverty of quantum mechanics. And I don't, I'm not saying quantum mechanics is wrong, it's just impoverished. In principle, if we were, you know, really ideologically committed quantum mechanics is, is in this room. We could write the wave equation, the famous Schrodinger wave equation. We could write it that would describe the motions of all the atoms in this room for the next 20 minutes. And it would not be deterministic, it would be probabilistic. And the probability is, you know, the increases, the possible endpoints increase enormously with, uh, with time. But still, you, you could write that equation. And my problem is if you got that equation, you could write that equation, and you say, this is true. This thing is true. This, predicts the motion of all the atoms in this room over the next 20 minutes. It's the best we can do, even though it's probabilistic. You know, that equation has nothing in it about people. It has nothing in it about seminaries. It has nothing in it about curiosity. Uh, that equation has nothing in it about uh, time limits to talks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing in it about that. Uh, so, so I think quantum mechanics adds, but if, if the goal is to reduce quantum mechanics and say that's fundamental truth and throw everything else away, that's, 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 that's barking up the wrong tree. So I want to get, just give an explanation. This comes actually from Crater, who I've added, filled it out a little bit, of what I'm talking about here. So here's something that psychologists and neuroscientists like to study. It's long-term spatial memory. Long-term spatial memory allows you to find your car in a parking lot like that. And some of us are not so good at that. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have hunted it for three, four, five minutes in a parking lot at Stanford trying to find my car. Without realizing I parked in a different parking lot. Right? <laughs> right? Um, so that, take that as our ex ex plan. What we want to do is understand how does long-term memory, spatial memory, work in the brain. And the first thing we do in scientists, the scientists, is we have to reduce this to something we can really study in the lab under highly controlled conditions. And a very popular way to study this is a mouse that's navigating, you know, a maze either on land or in water. And you can ask me if you want to later how we do that. So you know, we get the mouse trained up to do this, this certain kind of maze running. Um, and a major discovery in the history of neuroscience is that the hippocampus, it's a structure deep in the brain of a mouse contains a spatial map, and hippocampus is really uh, very important for uh, the mouse's ability to uh, learn how to navigate in a maze. Now you say, well, that's an answer in some sense, but how in the world does the hippocampus do that? What's the hippocampus made of? And it turns out that there's this phenomenon at a cellular level inside the neurons in the hippocampus called long-term potentiation, and that is a mechanism whereby the synapses, the junctions between two neurons where the messages get sent across, that, is, that's, that synapse can become stronger or it can become weaker through this phenomenon of long-term potentiation. 
And this, we think, is the basis of, of all long-term memory in the end. So if you get up tomorrow and you remember anything about what happens in this room tonight, it's because we're changing the synapses in your brain right now. Okay? We're physically changing the synapses in your brain. How does, how does that work? Well, there's this little protein that sits in the membrane called the NMDA receptor, or D-methyl-dis-pernate acid, something I don't remember exactly. Uh, this is an NMDA receptor that is critical for detecting coincident activity between the presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons, and either strengthening synapses through long-term potentiation or decreasing the strength through long-term compression. And you say, aha, that's the answer. Uh, but you say, well, how are those NMDA receptors regulated? And it turns out that there are very specific genes that produce more receptor molecules, more of these NMDA receptor molecules that get inserted into the membrane to strengthen the synapses. Now, we could keep going down, right, four, five, six levels below that, or we could go six, seven levels above. We could say, well, long-term spatial memory, that's, uh, that's about relationships with the environment, relationships with the environment ultimately is about, you know, it implies social relationships, and then we can talk about governments. But for the psychologists and the neuroscientists, if you really want to talk about long-term spatial memory, you're talking about these sort of five levels. And these pass Craver's mutual manipulability test. So the notion is that you can change the water maze on the mouse, right? You can put it in a different water maze, and you'll change the map in the hippocampus. The hippocampus will learn a new map. You can also go in and change the activity in the hippocampus. You can put in anesthetizing drugs, an anesthetizing hippocampus, and the mouse will become temporarily confused about where he is in a maze, and as soon as the drug wears off, he's back. Okay? That's mutual manipulability right there. You change the high level, and it changes low level components. You change the low level components, and it changes the high level behavior. And those arrows, both of those, I would argue, are causal manipulations, and the arrows of causality go in both directions. And it goes up and down through the, the set like this. So I can see thought bubbles over your heads out there. And, you know, what does all this mean? Why is he talking about NMDA receptors and hippocampus? I lost track of what's at stake here. And the key thing to remember that's at stake here is how do we think about self-determination and autonomy and personal responsibility? And remember we said that the key issue is what counts as a cause. And if we can talk, find a way to talk meaningfully about non-fundamental causation, okay? Remember fundamentalist causation is reducing everything to those four forces in physics. Uh, it, but if we can find a way to talk meaningfully about non-fundamental causation, and I think we must, then we can take mental causation and personal responsibility seriously, okay? So if, if, um, if, if this, if this sequence goes up as high as beliefs about the world and values about where you want to go in the world, and the causal relationships go in both directions at all layers, and if Carl Kramer is right, that the, fundamental, the fundamentally correct way to, for neuroscience explanation to work is multi-level interactions like this, then all of those levels are involved in meaningful causal, uh, and causally in the generation of behavior. And that says something important about us as humans, right? It says that we are neither purely top-down, like Descartes thought we were, and we're neither, neither are we purely bottom-up, but we are a complex mixture of the high-level and the low-level mechanisms. And I'm, I, I want to be very, very careful to say that this is not to say that bottom-up causes are important. I know that bottom-up causes are important, but it's just to say that this explanatory relevance runs both upwards and downwards. Okay, now I'm going to give you some concrete examples how this plays out in the real world. So here's, uh, I'm going to show you a pair of quotes about gene language. Uh, one is from Richard Dawkins in his famous book, The Selfish Gene, published in 1976. Uh, Dawkins says, genes swarm in huge colonies, safe inside gigantic lumbering robots. That's us, by the way. Uh, sealed off from the outside world. Communicating with it by tortuous and direct routes, manipulating it by remote control. They are in you and me. They created us, body and mind, and their preservation is the ultimate rationale for our existence. Okay? So this is a very bottom-up way of thinking about genes and about humans and our relationships to our genes. Now, Doc and his colleague in Oxford, Dennis Noble, published a book about 20 years later, that's longer than that, isn't it? 30 years later. 
uh, called The Music of Life, and he's deliberately kind of uh, paraphrasing or mocking Dawkins here. So here's Noble's way of describing the same thing. This is top down language. Noble says, genes are trapped in huge colonies, locked inside highly intelligent beings, molded by the outside world, communicating with it by complex processes through which blindly, as if by magic, function emerges. They are you and me. We are the system that allows their coming to be read, and their preservation is totally dependent on the joy that we experience in reproducing ourselves. We are the ultimate rationale for their existence. Now, this, is, this is looking at the same data, but it's looking at it in very different ways, right? Top down, bottom up. Here's a second concrete example of how this plays out in the world, and this one was particularly telling for me. Um, most of you probably don't know because you're not medical people. Most of you probably don't know about the Lasker Awards, but these are the equivalent of American Nobels for biomedical research. There many, a large fraction of Lasker Award winners have gone on to win Nobel Prizes in physiology or medicine. And I was actually rather shocked uh, in 2006 to read this article in the New York Times uh, that this gentleman here, uh, benign looking guy, was a psychiatrist who was among five chosen to win the Lasker Award in 2006. And uh, his name is Aaron Beck. Does that name ring a bell with you in the audience, Aaron Beck? He's, he's the guy who invented cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, the reason I was so surprised to see this in the New York Times is because the field of psychiatry went away, radically away from talk therapies in the 1970s as neuroscientists were starting to discover all these neurotransmitter systems inside the brain and the molecular receptors and psychiatrists could reach out and touch certain receptors like serotonin receptors by prescribing certain drugs, benzodiazepine receptors by just prescribing Valium and its relatives, Ambien, its benzodiazepine receptors. Uh, psychiatrists just went in droves away from talk therapies and said, okay, we're real science now. We can really get inside the brain. We can turn the knobs that actually matter in terms of causality. And, uh, you know, it was, and, and talk therapy was, was basically relegated to, to clinical psychologists. Um, I had a psychiatric fellow in my uh, lab at Stanford one time. I used to, I, I'd ask him, so, Dan, what did you learn today? You know, what did you learn in psychiatry? And he said, my new motto is, Leave no receptor unoccupied. <laughs> you know, make prescriptions and get every receptor occupied. Um, so, so the reason this is so important is that, that the reason he won the last award is that serious and very well controlled experiments were undertaken, large scale clinical trial experiments with severely depressed patients. And one group of depressed patients was given serotonergic reuptake inhibitors, the classic SSRI antidepressant drugs. Another group was given, and that alone, another group was given cognitive behavioral therapy alone. And the third group was given the SSRIs plus the cognitive behavioral therapy. And the data are really convincing in adults and in adolescents that the group does better that has both the cognitive behavioral therapy and the SSRIs, okay? Now that says something really important, right? It says that, that you can reach in at the level of the receptors at the bottom up and turn those knobs and you can have a positive effect on people's medical condition, but you are being irresponsible to your patients if you neglect the top down. And Aaron Beck actually talked about, about this as, as a top down intervention. And he, he, he talked about changing patients' beliefs about the world and their patterns of interaction with the world. And his shorthand for this was cognitive restructuring. Now that's a top-down intervention, okay? And we do humans a disservice, and we do patients a disservice, and parishioners a disservice if we regard humans as totally one or totally the other. The, the truth is that we're both. In flesh and blood, we're both. Uh, so Aaron Beck was out to do cognitive re re reconstruction, uh, cognitive restructuring. And you know what I really infer, I mean what I took away from this is that beliefs matter. Okay, beliefs about the world matter. They're very powerful, very strong, and they play a causal role in your behavior and your choices. So I would say as a neuroscientist, and I'm wrapping up now, that understanding the nature of human freedom is, I would say, it's the most important problem facing the neurobehavioral sciences. I think it's important for obvious reasons of human dignity and social responsibility. 
Uh, and I get really ticked off when my colleagues, uh, you know, and some of them may watch this eventually. Uh, and that's, that's okay. Um, I, I, when my colleagues uh, talk in very simplistic, reductionistic language, as though all of the behavior is, you know, the knobs at the bottom. And I, and I think it reduces, uh, it not only reduces dignity, it reduces incentive to be socially responsible, but it's just plain wrong. And it, it's wrong for patients and the way we treat patients. Uh, but I would say it's also important for, for science itself. Um, that uh, science depends on the whole idea that we're able to critically reflect on data. We're able to make rational, conscious decisions about what conclusions we believe are supported by data and what we're not. So it's, it's important for science itself. And this is, my, this is one of my two favorite quotes from J.B.S. Haldane, who was a famous geneticist in the middle of the last century, um, which points out this contradiction. Uh, Paul Lane says, if my mental processes are determined wholly by the notions of atoms in the brain, then I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true. And hence, I have no reason for supposing my brain to be composed of atoms. Uh, and there's this circular logic here, right? Uh, and so it's, it's critical uh, for humane reasons, but it's also critical for science to come up with some understanding of this nature of what I'm talking about, self-autonomy, self-determination, and, and freedom. Uh, I'm frequently asked after talks like this whether, you know, said, you know, you covered a lot of ground there, I'm not sure I got it all. Have you written a book on this stuff? And the answer is no, I haven't. Uh, I've written a couple of papers, which I'd be happy to give PDFs to that, and if any of you want it, they can be put online here uh, in the seminary. But I would like to recommend some books to you. So one is uh, by Malcolm Jeeves, who's a neuroscientist and psychologist, and Warren Brown, who's a psychologist and professor of uh, psychology, actually, at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena. And they wrote this book a few years back, Neuroscience, Psychology, and Religion, which I think is a really good book for those of you who might be interested in this. Uh, there are also questions that arise around this topic about the soul. You know, if, if this, this psychosomatic unity and the brain that I'm talking about is really the right way to think about brain and human behavior, and if the right way to think about freedom is in terms of these high-level organization states of the brain that comprise beliefs, values, aspirations, how do we think about the soul theologically? Uh, and I would recommend this book, written by Nancy Murphy, who's a professor of Christian faith and Christian philosophy at, at Fuller. Uh, she wrote this book about 10 years ago, Bodies and Souls, or Spirited Bodies. So Bodies and Souls is the dualistic thing, right? Uh, or is the right way to think about humans theologically and scientifically the Spirited Bodies. And uh, it's a short book. It's not long. It's uh, 150 pages, 120 pages, maybe something like that. I almost made a crack there, but I'll just I'll say. Um, uh, back on task. Uh, bodies and souls are spirited bodies. And I recommend that book. Here's another book that's good, a fairly recent book by Paul Gingorn, the physicist that I talked about, his young colleague Nicholas Peel, who actually comes from a computer science technology background. Questions of truth, 51 responses to questions about God, science, and belief. Uh, they cover the waters right here with these 51 questions. And they actually have an extended appendix about neuroscience. It's about a 40 page appendix about neuroscience. And I highly recommend that. I think they get a lot of the same issues I've been talking about. Though you'll see if you read it, the quantum mechanics thing creeps in there in a way that I wouldn't really buy into. So, with that, I will say thank you. And uh, I'll be happy to try to answer any questions that I've learned from you and you learn from me. The next hour long. So we have a microphone here. If you'll just raise your hand, if anyone wants to ask a question, so someone on the far right over here, and uh, we'll have a period here where we can reflect together. So that, uh, that quote that you put up there from Haldane, that uh, yeah. sort of logical loop there, Darwin noticed the same thing, and he ran into the same dilemma about the trustworthiness of the brain. It's such a watertight issue, it's such a watertight uh, argument, such a watertight issue to, to, to present. Like, if in your deal dealings with your colleagues, 
Yeah. Have you have you like how does that gone over? Have like have you talked to them? Like yes. does, they don't they don't like how, how do they how do they, they get around do. that? How do they speak out of that? They don't like public code at all. They just get frowns on their faces. <laughs> there must be something wrong with that. Actually, the, the most, you know, the easiest kind of out to that is that um, uh, the, 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 that these beliefs must be true because they work. So, you know, Holding says, if, I, if everything I think is determined by the motion of atoms in the brain, and uh, then I have no reason to suppose that what I think is true, therefore I have no reason to believe that my brain is composed of atoms. And uh, probably my scientist friends have pushed into the corner would say uh, they're true simply because they work in the world. Look at all this. This building stands up. You know, these beliefs, wherever they come from, that motions of atoms are wherever they work. Uh, and it, it would be something fairly, you know, fairly what I would call, you know, kind of combat like that. But th then, like, how do they, like, how do they trust the sensory input? And, like, how do they know they're not just the brains in the jars and everything? Like, <laughs> like how does that like it, like it comes to yeah I think I would probably say they don't know that we're not brains in a jar <laughs> I don't know that's where I know it's it's you know it's funny how uh, most scientists don't really think terribly carefully about these things you kind of as absorb this as part of the scientific culture and um, and don't reflect deeply about it frequently so I. I'm as puzzled as you are. Questions? Anything is fair game here? Don't be shy. <laughs> they don't ask you to play. Quick question. David Rock, are you familiar with his work? David Rock? No. He, he does some stuff with brain science and leadership. Okay. And I was trying to figure out if he would be, uh, somebody who would be bottom up that you talked about, because he talks a lot about how the chemistry reacts uh, in the brain, like if you say something that hurts somebody, it, it triggers the brain to respond in the same way as if you punched them. And so, is that bottom up? Good question. I, you know, I would say that it has both bottom up and top down components, right? I mean, when I drew up those things about, uh, you know, the, the hippocampus and spatial memory, those arrows run in both directions. So there's a top-down component, and then when you say something that that's derogatory and hurts someone, that is a high-level perception of a social communication from one person to another person, and that would fall into uh, Aaron Beck's cognitive restructuring land, right? So that's 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 very much top-down. But he's he's totally right that the. That, those, that that doesn't happen. You know, this, we're not in a Cartesian world. That doesn't happen out there in the ether somewhere. And they can transmit it to the brain. The reason that it's felt as hurtful is because there are circuits in the brain that mediate aversive reactions and positive reactions. And those circuits are activated and they involve certain chemicals, especially one called dopamine. Uh, and so there is a bottom up uh, uh, part of this as well. And, you know, if you want to, if somebody is, is chronically in a situation like this, one, of the, one example that the EMs are familiar with would be something like post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Um, you, if you want to address that, you want to address it both ways. There may be some drugs that manipulate the dopamine system that will help alleviate the symptoms, but you want to work at a behavioral level as well to try to reduce the associations, the negative associations, right? So you want to intervene at both levels. So I don't know exactly how Rock talks about it. I have to read his book to see is, is he is he thinking we've got fundamental truth at that chemical level and you know we can kind of ignore that high level, or is he saying that the stuff goes back and forth and it's part of the psychosomatic whole? And so if he's like that, I'd say I'm, I'm on the same page as he is. But if he's trying to say that it's all chemicals and wires, you know it is all chemicals and wires at some level. It's like saying an airplane is all wires and plastic and steel, titanium, whatever they make airplanes out of. An airplane is nothing but that stuff. And that's true to some extent. You know, there's no magic inside the airplane. But the critical thing is the way all of those parts are organized together to create some high level function. And that high level function or that purpose is, is carried out. You set the program in the drive flight of New York, and it affects the components. It's, uh, 
You know, so the, my problem is when neuroscientists start saying that uh, people are nothing but chemicals and liars. And, and it's true at one level, and it's also beside the point at another level. I'm you tell I'm not good at short answers. <laughs> Hi. I'm wondering if we've been talking about the top-down um, approach, kind of almost like a ladder. Yeah. And I'm wondering if at the very bottom level when we're dealing and we're getting involved with quantum mechanics and that sort of business, it occurs to me that that sort of stuff is also responsible for the very large level of stuff that happens on a galactic level with uh, the whole universe and the operations of that. So I'm wondering if a ladder isn't the best way to look at this, but maybe more circular and if at the very, very bottom, does it wrap around at some point? And so when we're looking at it, I mean, I don't know, is that... It sounds, sounds very Buddhist to me. <laughs> Because I think if it does sort of wrap around, then there becomes a sort of a certain organic integrity to the whole process of um, of the interactions, which I think would even give greater strength, greater weight to your argument if it does end up doing something like that, but this, or something. I don't know. I'll think about that. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, which I think is crazy. 
is inextricably linked to a biological brain. Yep. How would that be applied to something like prayer or interaction with God? So it's it what? Prayer or interaction with God. So would all prayer or experiences of God be nothing but God changing biology in the brain? Or is the theory of grace nothing more than God changing the biology of the brain? How would those two interact? Yeah. Okay, so I, I don't, I'm not certain that I'm understanding your question, but I, I think that um, you know, all of our experiences, we talked a little bit about memory. If you remember what we're about tonight, tomorrow, it's because things have changed in your brain. I think when we have religious experiences, things change in our brain. I think that you know, religious experiences are mediated through our senses, typically. Not always, but typically through our senses. Uh, but even things that happen internally within the brain that are not mediated through the senses have effects on the brain. And those experiences are going to be laid down and coded in your brain and carried with you. Uh, if you ever get damage to your brain, you, in certain parts of your brain, you may lose those experiences, right? So, um, so I, I don't see a problem with saying that our experience of God is mediated and recorded and given continuity through our lives through our brains. So there's a big question about what happens at the end of life. You know, because at the end of life the brain rots, right? Uh, and can I like, can what what kind of if I'm sitting here preaching the psychosomatic unity doctrine, uh, how do we think about resurrection or possible life beyond death? But that's not the question you're answering you're asking. Thank you. <laughs>
it requires a practice to break out of those things. So, so that kind of stuff is real. Now, that is a relationship with addiction. I mean, we don't understand addiction. There's a ton of research being done on it. Here's some things we know. We know there are reward systems in the brain. We know that you can place a very tiny, small microelectrode in certain places in a rat's brain or a mouse's brain and give the mouse the opportunity or the rat the opportunity to press a lever like that and they get a tiny jolt of electricity into that structure in the brain. And there are certain places in the brain where the rat will work frantically in order to get electrical stimulation, which is creating electrical activity in these certain structures called medial forebrain, bundle of the amygdala in places. And the, the central, the reason that was that observation, that was discovered in 1957, 59, is so important because it indicates the presence of a centralized reward system. Okay? So there are reward systems in the brain, and it seems like all of the things that are rewarding to us seem to tap into them. So human brain imaging experiments are now showing that some of these same structures are activated when humans are playing simulated stock market games inside a scanner. And these same structures that are activated by very basic rewards like food and drink and uh, access to sexual activity in, in rodents, these same structures get activated with stock market decisions. I mean, you, you score it on the stock market. So, the, so these reward systems exist. It's undeniable that they're deeply linked to dopamine pharmacology. Uh, but the current thought is that, is that addiction represents a, a going awry of learning. So rewards are critical to learning. Uh, and you know, when you miss a reward that you expect, you know there's something you need to learn about the world. And when you get a reward you don't expect, there's something you need to learn. As long as you're expecting and predicting all the rewards successfully, you've got the world by tail and you're predicting you understand things. But the, the mechanisms that are involved in this learning about rewards are probably going awry in addiction. And I think that addiction is a disease. I mean, I think, I think it uh, has real biological mechanisms and it's not, in general, it's not a fault of character. It's not something somebody can wake up one day and say, I'm going to be different. Uh, it is really a disease, and it, and it takes a, a sustained fight on the disease. Some of it can be of a bottom-up nature with, with medical intervention, but some of it is, can be of a top-down nature, like alcoholics anonymous, right? That, 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 so I would say that's a classic top-down intervention. But uh, that's one of the most deadly neurological diseases that, that we have that we need to understand much, much better. Please join me in thanking Bill.